YouTube as well. Uh, good morning. This is the House Healthcare Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. I'm Representative Bill Lippert, Chair of the Committee. Uh, we are continuing our testimony on a proposal from the Department of Public Safety in the governor's budget uh, that proposes adding mental health counselors to the Vermont State Police uh, to assist with crises that where the Vermont State Police and other law enforcement are often called where there may be a mental health issue or is a mental health issue involved. Um, we've taken testimony for several days and today I'm going to today uh, I'm going to turn the um, chairing the meeting over to our vice chair, Representative Ann Donahue, who has uh, helped organize has organized the testimony for today and has an update for us as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Representative Donahue. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is our third day and, and final day under a, a fairly crunch schedule to um, try to get some broad perspectives from various stakeholders. Uh, on this proposal. Um, and I really appreciate the way people have responded and, and made the time to, to join us. Um, uh, I mentioned be, when a few people weren't, weren't uh, on yet and we hadn't gone live, we do have one addition to the agenda because uh, we did have a committee member request and I thought it made sense to ask for uh, somebody a little bit more at the frontline level from the law enforcement uh, perspective of how they see the program in this case that's working in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, so that will be um, added. We had a few of our 15 minute slots where people uh, were not able to, uh, to come. So we did have a little bit of time to work with. I'm also hoping we'll end up with maybe about 15 minutes at the end to have a brief committee discussion on what people's sense is of where we um, might wanna look at in terms of recommendations. Um, but we're starting this morning with uh, the, the one person who has a little bit, little larger block of time. And so I want to give a brief background. Um, it was this committee three years ago uh, that passed a bill that created the Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. And that was very specifically in response to concerns about use of force and in particular use of deadly force uh, with people um, who appeared to be in a mental health crisis. Um, there were a lot of concerns about some deaths that had occurred. And the concept was that although we had systems in place to um, you know, review whether an officer had acted wrongly or not, we didn't have anything that looked more at what are the opportunities for the future? What can we learn from something uh, where uh, things may have gone wrong, but there was not a liability necessarily, but what could we learn? and what recommendations might come out of that. So it certainly would make sense to hear uh, recommendations. There was the first report of the review of uh, that first death that came out early this year. And unfortunately, um, our whole world turned upside down in terms of planning that we might've had to hear about that report um, uh, during the regular session. Um, and so that's why I want a little bit of extra time. Uh, we have here the chair of that commission, Wilda White. Um, I wanted her to have a little bit of time at least to give an overview of that report as well as um, what recommendations uh, she might have from that specific perspective um, in particular uh, on this proposal. Um, so uh, Wilda, welcome. And you're on. Give me a second. I'm looking for my mouse so I can permanently unmute myself. There, I found it. Um, thank you, Vice Chair Donahue. My name is uh, Wilda White, and uh, I've been invited here as the chair of the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. Um, and I'm also hoping to speak uh, uh, personally or, or on, on behalf of um, other psychiatric survivors. Um, about this uh, proposal as well. Uh, specifically, my invitation um, to speak here today asked me to talk about the Brennan Report, but also asked for, um, and I'm going to read it, 
The committee is also interested in any perspective you have regarding any additive impacts of racial and psychiatric discrimination. So I'll also be addressing that topic today. Just to give you a little bit more information about my background, I do consider myself a psychiatric survivor. I, um, uh, meaning that I have suffered abuse and harm at the hands of uh, psychiatry. Uh, I also uh, have been labeled with a severe mental illness for which I receive uh, no mental health care, uh, which according to the Treatment Advocacy Center uh, makes me 16 times more likely to be killed by a police officer. So I take these issues uh, very seriously um, and I'm very uh, pleased with the invitation to be here today because it is for me a matter of life and death. Uh, the Grinnan uh, Commission, I want to say at the outset, has taken no position on um, the proposal that you uh, have before you. Uh, but I will begin by giving you a summary of uh, that investigation and our conclusions. Uh, Phil Grinnan was a 76-year-old man who was killed in his apartment in March 2016 by uh, the Burlington Police Department. Um, officers... Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and what we found was that um, Mr. Grennan's death um, was the result of, the majority of the commission felt it was the result of a kind of a, a service and communication failures between um, several uh, agencies. And I wrote a um, kind of uh, additional opinion that um, his death was also the result of the failure of the Burlington Police Department to follow its own policies. Um, and, and that failure to do so was a result of implicit bias against people with mental health um, <clears throat> challenges. Um, essentially what happened was that uh, Mr. Grinnan had been deteriorating for uh, almost a year um, uh, after his, um, caseworker at the Howard Center um, left and he had quite a close attachment to her. That, uh, that case manager had been his case manager for the longest of any of his case managers. He had received care there for almost uh, 18 or 19 years and he had been assigned a new case manager like every couple of months. But finally he, had, he was with the case manager who he had been with for at least two years. They developed a close working relationship she moved on to another job and he was devastated by it. Um, so uh, he started, uh, he stopped taking his medication, which was not recognized or documented by his psychiatrist, but it was clear to his psychiatrist that he was becoming more and more psychotic. Um, and psychosis, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, um, as used by Western medicine, um, it's when people can perceive things through the, any of the senses um, that uh, others don't uh, perceive or where people can think things um, that are not part of the consensus reality. In Mr. Grennan's case, um, he believed that the police department was coming to his apartment to kill him. And um, he reported that to his um, psychiatrist um, and while his psychiatrist did uh, warn uh, certain people like street outreach that was never conveyed to the police department. Um, so on the date of his death, um, a neighbor had called street outreach to complain about noise coming from Mr. Grennan's apartment. Um, and so street outreach who was at the time embedded, I know that's a charged word, but that is the word that they used, um, embedded in the police department um, attended roll call and asked the sergeant to assign some officers to accompany her to his apartment. She, this street outreach worker had been told that she couldn't go to Mr. Grennan's apartment alone because he had threatened to um, harm people who came to his door. Um, street outreach had been going to his door periodically and he would never let them in. And each time they came to his door, he had called the psychiatrist and said, stop sending these people to my door. He thought they were gonna kill him and he was gonna protect himself with knives and self-defense if they continue to appear. So on uh, this day in March, he showed up at his, he, he um, the street outreach worker got two officers to come to his house. 
Uh, and while they were en route, they received another 911 call from the apartment manager who also called to report that Mr. Grennan was making noise in his apartment, threatening to kill people or to harm people, although he never left his apartment and no one saw him. Um, when you know police officers arrived, they knocked on his door. He didn't answer. They used the key to enter. And when they uh, opened the door, they saw him standing there holding two knives. Um, they immediately drew their guns, shouted for him to drop the knives, and one of the officers threatened to shoot him twice. Or not threatened to shoot him two times, but threatened twice to shoot him. <laughs> so uh, Mr. Grennan de-escalated the situation by closing the door at the same time that the police officers uh, discharged their tasers. So over the next four hours, the officers tried to get him out um, through drilling holes in his apartment, through um, shouting commands, through uh, telephones, and none of that um, got him out of the apartment. At, at the end of four hours, uh, Chief Del Pozo made the decision to go into the apartment. He said because he was concerned that Mr. Grennan would kill himself because an officer had falsely reported that Mr. Grennan said he was going to kill himself. Mr. Grennan never had done so and no witness reported. They went in, they had several plans to try to get him. He was found hiding in the bathroom. They had several plans to try to get him out of the bathroom. Ultimately, they decided to um, use a taser to get him out of the bathroom after pepper spray failed to drive him out of the bathroom. Um, the, bedroom, the, the way the apartment was configured, it was very small. Um, it was actually, um, he was in a bathroom that entered into a bedroom that entered into a living room. The Burlington Police Department chose to cram seven people into his bedroom, um, one of whom shot a taser into the bathroom. Immediately before shooting the taser, the man said, um, as soon as I see him, I'll hit him. Um, Mr. Grennan, thinking that the police were there to kill him, um, as soon as he was hit with the taser twice, he came out of the bathroom, the committee decided in self-defense to try to defend himself as he said he would. Because the bathroom, because the area where the police officers were was so small, not all of them could get out of the bedroom in time to avoid the charging Mr. Grennan. Four became trapped in the uh, bedroom because it was too small with too many people in there. Um, and then one of the officers then had to, uh, the committee found, um, shoot Mr. Grennan because they had no uh, means to escape because the area was too small. Uh, Mr. Grennan was taken to UVM Medical Center and pronounced dead uh, seven minutes after arriving. Um, cause of death was homicide by law enforcement. So, um, that's the general factual background. Um, a couple of things that um, were important there. Um, kind of Mr. Grennan's death kind of was put into motion when his treating psychiatrist decided to allow him to decompensate until he came to the attention of the police department. Um, secondly, uh, you know, the Howard Center, when Mr. Grennan started missing appointments, the Howard Center started sending out street outreach, other uh, kind of workers, everyone except his treating psychiatrist tried to visit him as an apartment, but he wouldn't let them in because his psychosis uh, made him fear that they were there to harm him. Um, unfortunately, his psychiatrist went on vacation at some point um, and no one was um, left kind of in charge of his care. So he essentially kind of fell through the cracks. When he sent an email to his psychiatrist warning her to stop sending police to his apartment or street outreach to his apartment and said he was gonna defend himself, the psychiatrist actually received that email when she was on vacation and then alerted certain people, but not the police that that was his position. And she also did not um, reach out to Mr. Grennan or they didn't have a treatment plan to address his, his, this fear. Um, uh, and they basically uh, decided to wait for Mr. Grennan to contact them if he wanted care rather than reaching out to Mr. Grennan. Um, this is true even though um, Mr. Grennan in the three months before his death made several threats against people to kill them and the Howard Center gave a um, 
discharge its duty to warn those people. But even though they're giving a duty to warn, which you give when you feel that someone is a danger to others, they didn't use that same assessment that he was a danger of others to use any kind of involuntary procedure to, uh, to give him care. So that was the first thing that the, um, the commission found was problematic about um, the events that led to Mr. Grennan's death. What the police did when they arrived, they, they, um, they did not follow any of their policies. Um, they had a policy that when you are dealing with someone who you know is impaired because of a mental illness and who is unable to follow your command, they have a policy about containing the person and not unduly encroaching upon their space. Both things they did. Um, they drove him out of his apartment when there was no need to do so. The police acknowledged that Mr. Grinnan had committed no crime. He was not under arrest. It was apparently a welfare check. Um, and instead of giving him space, um, they, they, they kept encroaching on him. Even after they entered this, they say because they thought he might kill himself, even after finding him safe and unharmed and hiding in his bathroom, they still continued to try to drive him out of the bathroom when it was not safe to do so because of how small the bedroom was, how unprotected the offices were. They continued to do so, violating their own policy. They also have a communication policy about how you talk to someone in this, in this case. Um, also, they did not follow that. They were supposed to ask open-ended questions. They never asked an open-ended question. You're supposed to be honest and truthful. They never told Mr. Grinnan while they were there. Um, they shouted at him using command presence, um, even though um, most people dealing with people who um, are in extreme states, uh, you know that um, command presence is actually triggering um, rather than um, de-escalating. Um, they also had a policy of using um, crisis counselor, cri cri crisis negotiators, also known as hostage negotiators, and not um, deciding to use uh, you know, less than lethal or lethal force before consulting with the crisis negotiators about the decision. Burlington police never consulted with the crisis negotiators about their decision to enter the apartment and drive them out. In fact, the crisis negotiators were in the process of setting up an alternative means of communicating with Mr. Grennan when they learned that uh, Chief Del Pozo had made a decision to enter the apartment. And by the time the crisis negotiators entered the apartment, the police department had already made entry, were already demanding Mr. Grennan to kind of leave the bathroom. So we found that that was another um, problem. They also had a policy not to use a taser on a person with a known uh, mental health issue um, before talking to um, a, a crisis worker. On site at the time that this whole endeavor was uh, happening was a, a mental health crisis worker from the Howard Center. She was never consulted about how to approach Mr. Grin and she would just sat in the car across the street during the whole four hour operation. Um, and uh, if I could j just for one second, I, I think this is really important information and I think the committee um, needs to and wants to hear from it. We also have kind of circumstances beyond our control in terms of timing. So um, if you could sort of move to recommendations, including your own personal thoughts and recommendations, um, that would be great because uh, we want to have a little bit of time for committee questions um, as well. Thank you for understanding. Okay. Um, so obviously the first recommendation would be to you know you follow your policies <laughs> um the, they would have made it they would have prevented mr um Grinnell's death another that i want to just say the last policy they didn't follow which was most critical was to use time um as your friend and um and and, and take the time to get the equipment that would allow you to safely um take someone into custody there was a safe way to take them into custody they didn't have that particular tool and they made no effort to get it um, so our recommendations were basically, um, basically the committee came up with all these recommendations that would have prevented his death. And then when we looked at Burlington Police Department's policies, it was clear that they had 
all of our recommendations were already included in Burlington Police Department's policies. And so I looked further to see why those policies weren't adhered to. And I found in several instances that I thought it was because of just an implicit bias against people with mental health um, challenges, both the derogatory language that they used, um, the um, falsely reporting that he was going to kill himself, falsely reporting that he wanted to be killed by police. All of those things played a, played a role in Mr. Grennan's death. I will, um, and, and, and then just not even using the crisis workers who were on the premises. Um, and the other thing that's maybe a little counterintuitive, this was just not an appropriate um, case for street outreach. Mr. Grennan had a psychiatrist um, and street outreach, the well-intentioned, every time they tried to reach out to him, he, it triggered him. Um, and the street outreach worker who was on, who, who came to his day, house the day he lived, the day he died, talked about how, how in over her head she felt, that this was not a situation that she felt that she had been trained to deal with. Um, so in terms of um, the, uh, looking through this um, for kind of through a race lens, um, I mean, the, my, the primary problem is, is that um, this proposal will definitely adversely affect people, black people and people of color. Um, because it should not be left to law enforcement to determine whether an individual in need of mental health referral, it should not be left to law enforcement to determine whether an individual is in need of mental health referral because implicit bias will definitely um, play a role in that and will perpetuate the disproportionate number of black people and indigenous people who are referred to mental health clinicians and diagnosed with mental illnesses. Currently in our society, black people and Native Americans are disproportionately diagnosed with mental illnesses. Um, there's a long history uh, in our society of equating race with insanity um, and anxieties about racial differences have historically shaped clinical encounters. Uh, in fact, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, so many black men were being diagnosed with schizophrenia simply based on their race that it became known as the protest psychosis. In Vermont, black Vermonters are disproportionately represented in the highest level of involuntary hospitalization at Vermont Psychiatric um, Care Hospital. 15% of the patients held there are, are black and people of color. So allowing police officers to use their lay understanding of mental illness coupled with their implicit biases will exacerbate the disproportionate rates that black and indigenous Vermonters are diagnosed with mental illnesses. Um, two years ago, I gave a keynote address at the national conference talking about what I saw as the transformation of mass incarceration into mass medicalization. That is turning black and brown prison inmates into black and brown mental patients um, as a way to um, preserve um, basically traditional uh, uh, Jim Crow caste system in our society. So I find proposals like this that further uh, entrench both, uh, both systems of social control, the mental health system and the law, enforce, uh, law enforcement system, uh, as we further entrench those into the lives of black people and further surveil them, um, we will see years down the road, um, uh, basically, you know, going from the prison system to the convict leasing system to the Jim Crow system to mass incarceration and to mass medicalization. Um, so I think this is a really dangerous proposal. Um, I think that it's, it, while you know, maybe at the beginning of the year it might have seemed progressive. I think in this post George Floyd, post uh, COVID. Um, that this is actually um, uh, a, a, an idea whose time has uh, come and passed. Um, I think uh, it's just incumbent upon us to get law enforcement out of uh, uh, mental health. Um, and it's really incumbent upon us to get mental health practitioners more aware of their racial biases um, to deliver better health care to uh, black and uh, people of color. So I will stop there.
very much appreciated. Are there um, any questions from uh, committee members? You've clearly been really clear um, in your testimony. We, we have another minute or two, uh, even though I'm trying to keep things very um, focused. Um, so okay. don't be uh, shy, um, Representative uh, Christensen. We understood what you believe is wrong with the system. Do you have a solution that we could actually implement that is not a long-term change the entire system um, for what you feel is needed? Yes, I appreciate your question. Um, I think one thing that would make the biggest difference in the delivery of health care, uh, especially mental health care in, in the state of Vermont is the inclusion of people with lived experience at every, at every level. And I say that because we are currently being excluded from everything. We're silenced, we're censored, we're socially erased. And I think that our silence is killing us. And I'll give, us, I'll give you an example. Um, and I, when I went to the Team 2 training, um, it, for me, it was like the blind leading the blind. You had mental health practitioners who were doing things, embedded mental health practitioners who were doing things that were um, really ill-informed. For example, during one scenario, uh, the, embedded, the way the embedded uh, mental health worker approached the person who was playing the person in crisis, the first question out of that person's mouth was, are you mentally ill? Um, I think if, if a, live, a person with lived experience had been involved in um, coming up with that scenario, we would have told that mental health worker that that is the absolute wrong question to ask somebody that you suspect of having a mental illness because that is very triggering and disrespectful. Um, you know, another thing that happened at that Team 2 training was um, there was derogatory language uh, used to describe people with mental illnesses. Um, that was not even, no one even called anyone out on it. Um, if a person with lived experience had been there, we could have immediately said, hey, that, that's, that's not conducive, that betrays an implicit bias, we need to talk about that. In the Phil Grinning case, the police officers talked very close, like within 10 feet of him and said everything they were gonna to do to him without knowing that people who um, are in extreme states, particularly psychosis, have super acute hearing. A whisper is like a shout. And so he could hear everything they were going to they were saying about him, and it can, uh, for example, they were going to slam him to the ground, they were going to tase the shit out of him, they were going to hit him with this, they were going to blind him with pepper spray, all of these things he's hearing most likely, um, which triggered them because the police did, had no knowledge about this condition called hyperacusis that comes with psychosis. If they were working more in concert with our community. Um, of psychiatric survivors, they would learn these things. And I think because they don't know these things, it really actually led to the death of Phil Grennan. And so if you wanna do one thing, you ask for one thing that didn't cause the whole system to change, you must include psychiatric survivors at every level of these interactions um, with psychiatric, with people who are experiencing these um, mental crises. Thank you. Um, Representative Smith. Thank you. A uh, question about the individual that uh, was in his own apartment. Had, had he, maybe the condition, his, his mental condition caused him to rebel and, and fight this police that when they, 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 I think they sound like they went into their, his apartment, not on the right track apparently, but had he lied down on the floor and said, I'm not going to do anything he probably would be alive today, wouldn't he? I, I don't really quite understand your question. Had he, had well, he not had he not come outside the bathroom? Had he not been had he had he not been psychotic? Yeah, he'd be probably alive today. Well, with with the condition that he had, uh, was that the reason that he was rebellious and chose not to uh, not to move? I wouldn't say that he was rebellious. I would say that Mr. Grinnan thought he was going to be killed and he was acting in self-defense. What happens when you're psychotic, you don't really lose your ability to reason. You're, you, necessarily, you, you're operating on a set of facts that may not be correct. 
Any of us, I believe, who thought we were going to be killed would likely do something to prevent it. That was what Mr. Grennan was doing. He just That's didn't understand point, yeah. that there was no threat. All right, thank you. Uh, Representative Cordes. Thank you. I was, um, I'm just supporting what, um, thank you for uh, your testimony. I was just, I'm gonna support what uh, her response to uh, Representative Smith. Um, I think any of us, regardless of uh, what kind of uh, mental or emotional stress or conditions that we had, uh, I would, if I were, a black man in his situation um, or anyone, I would have responded the same way, whether or not I was experiencing psychosis. Uh, so just to say that, and it, it feels a bit like uh, victim blaming to, uh, so I'm, I just wanna say that. Um, and another, uh, I'd like to counter the, notion that um, aside the, the, the notion of aside from completely revamping um, our system, I actually think that's um, what we need to do. I know we're not in discussion right now, so I'm just going to leave it at that, but I felt like it was important to say. Thank you. Yes, I think we need to hold off on discussion because of trying to get through our, our witnesses. Um, uh, but uh, we want to take one last question, Representative Page, and then we're going to we're going to move ahead. Yes, um, thank you for your testimony. I'm curious. Uh, I'm finding that perhaps you know our mental health practitioners or individuals who have life experiences, um, we may have issues trying to recruit those individuals to our various state designated agencies. Do you have any ideas how we could better do that here? Um, and I suppose, uh, would you recommend also not just having these individual practitioners, individuals' life experiences, but also have more training for our police officers? I have no ideas about recruiting mental health uh, clinicians. That's outside my bailiwick. Um, um, I, th I think it would be relatively easier to recruit uh, people with uh, psychiatric histories um, who, who also would require some education and training. Um, and I don't think that the training and education that, that uh, is required is limited to just law enforcement. I also think that uh, mental health workers could benefit from some training led by psychiatric survivors so that they uh, understand us more and understand our, our, our lives. I think that people who work in this field have a limited understanding of us um, because they're working at the extremes of what they might think of as pathology. And there's a great range of how um, you know, mental distress and extreme states are, are um, expressed um, that I don't think they see. And they don't really see us in our day-to-day -day, day -day lives outside of clinics and they don't understand how some of the things that they do and some of the things we experience in discrimination and oppression we experience in a large society affects us. Um, and I think that uh, as a psychiatric survivor, I would benefit from my clinicians having a more holistic understanding of, of me and my daily life. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wilda. Much appreciated um, for your insights. and. Uh, we are going to move to hearing um, from Representative uh, Pages and Representative Smith's neck of the woods, um, and that is to uh, hear uh, jointly or, or one after the other. We're, again, keeping to that sort of 10 minutes with uh, a little bit of time afterwards for committee discussion, um, but to hear both from um, uh, Jennifer, uh, sorry, I'm not, Harlow. Uh, and you can introduce your uh, position and background and, and uh, if you could share with us um, your perspective uh, from 
your uh, vantage point on the uh, issue of engagement in a mental health crisis and the role for uh, mental health uh, clinical uh, folks as with the proposal that's before us. And uh, then you'll be followed up by uh, Tomas Jankowski from Northeast Kingdom uh, Mental Health, uh, who I think you, uh, is the agency that you work with. Yes, ma'am, thank you very much. Uh, so I apologize, I've not been able to read through all of um, the discussions that have been partaking so far in this and I was given extremely short notice but no I, I want to say yeah we're very grateful that you were able to come on very short notice and very sort short of maybe notice. don't don't worry about the background but just a snippet of your your experience um, in uh, working with Northeast Kim mental health and that will that will help inform our background and we really appreciate you uh, re really I think on about 15 minutes notice or so uh, helping bring this perspective to the table. Well, thank you, and I'm, I'm glad to be here. So my name is Jennifer Harlow. I'm the Sheriff for Orleans County. I'm newly appointed this past January. Uh, I have over 24 years in law enforcement, um, and I worked prior to my position here at the Sheriff, being becoming Sheriff. I was with Newport Police Department for 16 years. I have, um, I've worked patrol. I have, for nine of those years when I was with Newport, I investigated sex crimes involving adults and children. So I was assigned to the Special Investigations Unit as a detective and investigated internet crimes against children as well. So there is a lot that I'm not gonna get into, but um, so I have quite a bit of experience. And as far as what we're talking about today, um, I can only talk about my personal experience um, involving this. So, you know, law enforcement in general, we don't, we are on the same page as all of you are. We are not, we do not feel that we are equipped to respond to all mental health crises, but we are being called to do so. And we have thankfully received a lot more training than we did when I first started my career. And I'm very grateful for that. And I actually took it upon myself to further my education in certain areas so that I, I had a better understanding of the population that I was dealing with. Um, and working with in this community. So I've taken, um, as far as having a social worker with working with law enforcement, I have not seen it. I have not seen a lot of negative things in that situation. I've only seen really positive things. Now, as I'm sure you all can realize and know, it has to be the right person who's working together whether that's you know, the right law enforcement officer or the right social worker. When we're responding to these calls, and in my experience, when we are dealing with people who are facing a mental health crisis, they may be calling the, the department several times a day and they, they're not actually having an emergency, they're just wanting to talk to somebody. That's when we have you know, referred that to their case manager or gotten them involved with somebody who can actually just make those phone calls to them to reassure them, get them whatever they need um, so they're not contacting law enforcement and so that we're not necessarily the first ones having that interaction with that person. But where I've seen incidences where, um, and unfortunately we can all do things better and it, you know, I'm very sympathetic and to situations that have gone bad. And, you know, thankfully we have, or hopefully we have learned and made ourselves better at responding to those situations. But again, we're getting called to situations where people are in crisis at that particular moment. Now they may have weapons, they may have, you know, hostages, things, you know, people in their family, things of that nature. We're not, you know, and, and then we're also responding to very various, um, sorry if I'm stumbling a little bit, various degrees of crises. But when law enforcement is responding, and if you ask a social worker or somebody from mental health, they're wanting us to be there because it's our job as law enforcement to make sure that everybody is safe. And that includes the person who is experiencing the crisis. So when we've had workers that have been the Newport Police Department, it has worked very well because one, this person may have a background with this individual already. They're obviously more trained, have more education around what that person may be um, suffering from, or maybe they haven't been diagnosed with anything yet. And maybe it's, you know, we don't know at that particular time. But we are always and have always, in my experience, been willing to have that person step forward and be that first point of contact. But we, are, we can't do that, nor do the social workers want us to do that until it's safe to do so. 
because we don't want to put anybody in harm's way that is not necessary. But I've been in situations where we've had, um, you know, the social worker, the crisis worker come to a scene with us. We've assessed the situation, made sure everybody was okay. And we and law enforcement has stepped back. We have spe stepped back far from our cruisers. And we've even left the scene, depending to make depending on what the situation is and if it's safe to do so. We have done that and allowed that social worker and that person to meet and do whatever needs to be to, to happen next. Um, you know, I've heard it's been extremely frustrating in certain cir circum sorry, in certain situations here. With the speaking for the sheriff's department. Um, we only have a few people on the road at certain times right now, um, so I'm really working on building our our department, but as I can speak from experience with Newport, working for that department where we're much, that department is much busier having a lot more calls um, involving those who are, you know, suffering from a crisis, but that we're constant, this is very time consuming, and we don't want people to be, you know, Tomas can also um, speak to this, that we've had meetings with them and the state's attorney has had meetings with them. This is not a, we do not want to put these individuals who need help in the jail system. Nobody wants to do that. We know that that is not the right place for them, but unfortunately, sometimes our hands are tied. And in order to keep that person safe, as well as the community, that is what needs to be done in order to get them the services that they need. And that is a last resort, trust me. Um, I can't speak for everyone's experience throughout the state of Vermont or through the country, but in our experience here in the Northeast Kingdom, for the most part, in dealing with the Newport Police Department and the Sheriff's Department, which I have obviously intimate experience with, is that we do everything in our power to make sure that they're connected with who they need to be connected with um, and getting the help that they need, not necessarily us being there. And it is extremely time consuming where we have you know, calls for domestic assaults or, you know, crashes or things like that are happening when we have law enforcement that's tied up at a hospital with an individual waiting on different things to be happening when we should, when, you know, we shouldn't be, hopefully we don't have to be there, but we're there because nurses don't feel safe, doctors don't feel safe with the, with how this person's behaving, with what, you know, is being said, the threats. So we're dealing with really severe situations where law enforcement, you know, is in, is dealing. And I've had you know, I've listened to the radio, I've listened to dispatch calls um, where, you know, social workers or mental health is calling law enforcement to go do welfare checks on these individuals who are on their caseload and they haven't heard from them because they're worried about the children or they're worried about other people in the homes. So again, we're being asked to respond to these situations where we're going to because we want to make sure that people are safe. But we also recognize, I don't think that there's one law enforcement officer that will tell you that we're the right person for the job. We're not always. Are we there to make sure that we hopefully contain the situation, make sure people are safe, and then we bring in other people? In my experience, we have we obviously default to the um, social worker, or the mental health worker who's working because they know what's bad. You know, they know what's how to deal with those certain situations, certain diagnoses, what's going to help, what's not going to help. We also try to work with our community and family members. So that when we when and if we have to respond to these individuals within our community, that we have a better understanding of that. So this is what triggers this person. This is what might be helpful to this, this person. These are the conversations that this person enjoys having. Um, these are the people that you don't want to mention because it may trigger that individual. Are we going to get it right every single time? Absolutely not. But having that person co-located in um, you know Newport Police or the State Police within our area it's gonna be beneficial to this community and who we're responding to. So Thank I could you. probably talk for a lot more longer, but if anybody has no, any but, questions. No, but I, I think it was very valuable to us. Um, Tomas, if you could maybe just add a few words um, from your perspective, and then we'll try to fit in a few quick questions um, so that we're not running too far behind, but uh, uh, Tomas? Sure. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. For the record, my name is Tomas Jankowski. I'm the president and CEO of Northeast Kingdom Human Services, and I have served in my role for just over two years. And uh, Chair Donahue and the members of the committee, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to, to spend a few minutes with you. And certainly a, a big thank you to um, Sheriff Harlow for her time and, and such a passionate uh, statement that she made and, and I appreciate it very much. As our organization, our organization works very closely with um, all the 
uh, law enforcement agencies in the Northeast Kingdom, and we are very proud of it. As a matter of fact, we have been engaged over a number of months in conversations uh, with, the, uh, with the top leadership that also includes the attorney, uh, attorneys general uh, from, the, from the three counties or from the two counties. And uh, COVID definitely worked its miracle in preventing us uh, to move on this topic uh, quicker than we anticipated. Uh, I think that uh, those two uh, agencies are inseparable. I think we have a, uh, an incredible opportunity right now uh, when so many stakeholders are included in a conversation to come together and really debate and uh, come up with the best ideas. Because in my judgment, there is no one solution that, fit, that, that fits it all. And, uh, and I think what we currently know as the uh, co-located um, approach uh, may, may need to morph into some other approaches. I think uh, our organization, as we are um, working on the uh, co-located system with the police, we are also looking at the peer-to-peer -peer support. And in our definition, the peer-to-peer -peer support is our uh, employees, our workers' presence on the street. As a matter of fact, we are developing a program that's called uh, Talking Benches, and we would like to have them dispersed throughout the city uh, where people and, and um, uh, market them accordingly so people can gravitate to and our employees, our workers, our peers support people can approach those individuals sitting on those benches and engage them in a conversation, hopefully address issues that may be brewing or perhaps prevent things uh, and is or issues from uh, escalating. We have had multiple uh, positive experiences of um, the escalating um, very, um, uh, very tense situations. I was a witness to one when I spent a couple of nights, a couple of night shifts, personally uh, riding along with the Newport City Police and the uh, Vermont State Police. Those experiences to me are in, 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 invaluable. And I think they opened my eyes as the leader of this organization to appreciate the very hard work our police is investing in the well-being of, of our communities. And frankly, we cannot do it alone, alone. They cannot do it alone, and we cannot do it alone. There are many circumstances, as, as uh, Sheriff Harlow uh, mentioned, where uh, there is going to be an inherent risk involved, and uh, neither party can effectively work in isolation. And, uh, and uh, so um, I could not be more supportive of the work that your committee is doing and, the, um, and all of the stakeholders, in, um, in, um, uh, all of the stakeholders uh, impact on this process. And I certainly would like to volunteer my organization and my own time in continuously working on finding the solutions that are going to really bring the, uh, the value to the communities that we all are uh, charged with serving. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for maybe just a, a few brief questions if somebody has a um, you know, burning follow-up here. Uh, Representative Rogers. Thanks, I just have a follow-up for Sheriff Harlow. Um, we were hearing in testimony yesterday about kind of the, the difficulty at times of people knowing whether they should be calling 911 or reaching out to the designated agency or I, I, who to call. I guess I'm curious if there's instances where your department would receive a phone call and from the, and from the phone call, it's clear that it's actually not an issue the police should be responding to. It's an issue that would be more appropriate for the designated agency. So that's, that's the first question. And then the second question is, what options do you have in that situation? Are you pretty much completely obligated to send out a law enforcement response because the call came to you? Or do you have an option to just say, we're transferring this, this situation over? What, 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 what options are you left with if that situation arises? Thank you for that question. That's a, it's a really good one. So we have, so we do have options. If somebody is calling us and we can um, clearly and safely, you know, for instance, I've also dispatched in my <laughs> years and had to cover the desk. And we had this one individual who just would keep calling 911 or keep calling our office and he just wanted to talk. So clearly um, that was 
you know, not an emergency or anything like that. So what I did was that I contacted, I was able to speak with him long enough and, you know, try and figure out exactly kind of what was going on. He was able to provide me with a caseworker. So I was able to contact that caseworker myself, advise them what was going on, and then they were able to make contact with that person. If we're dealing with somebody, um, you know, who just may need to talk with somebody, uh, then we would refer them to Northeast Kingdom Human Services and contact a crisis worker and say, we just got into contact with a certain individual. We don't believe if there's a police um, response needed. Here's that, inf here's that information. We give that to the person who's also the client who's also calling and also the, um, the on-call social worker. The problem is, is that, not the problem, but what we see mostly is that we don't have those cases. We have these cases where people are calling saying, you know, I'm having a really difficult time. I feel like I might be hurting myself. And we obviously have to respond to those situations to make sure that that person is not harming themselves, harming anyone else or anything of that nature. So when we're responding to those, you know, we can talk with them. Do you have any means? We ask them straightforward questions. You know, are you thinking about killing yourself now? Do you have a means to do so? Do you have any firearms? Do you have any weapons in the home? When they are saying no to all that and we figure out that we're all safe and that they just need to speak with somebody, then we quickly, you know, can move forward to um, having somebody respond to the residents or bringing them to the hospital where they can speak with somebody. What I forgot to mention earlier is that when we're dealing with certain situations, um, they have to be cleared medically. These individuals have to be cleared medically to make sure that they don't have any um, alcohol, if they don't have any other illicit drugs or things of that nature on board so that they can be, and um, Tomas can answer this more efficiently than I can, but in our experience, these individuals have to be cleared to make sure that there's everything is out of their systems so that they can be um, screened by workers and that way they can best determine what is going on with this individual if it's clearly you know something of a mental health or is it a combination of mental health and you know using alcohol or maybe there could be so many varieties of um, instances and examples of what can happen but there is definitely a process for sure but did that answer your question representative mostly yes mm -hmm. did you I'm sorry did you have anything that you need me to clear up or um, no, I think that that's the gist of it. I guess I'm just trying to understand the ins the instances in which the police or law enforcement response would would take the initiative to decide to step back versus versus not. So I think I think I, I got the gist of it. Thank you. Right. So if we if we responded to somebody who maybe um, was thinking about harming themselves or had you know high ideation ideations of that and then we we responded and we learned that they were safe and that they didn't actually have any um means or weren't actively in that state then we could definitely step back bring in um a social worker who would then if they felt safe being with that individual then we would step back and possibly leave the scene completely if it was safe to do so and i've and as i explained earlier i've been in situations where we have done that everyone's felt safe and comfortable and we've left the scene and you know we don't respond back unless we're needed. Thank you. And, and if, I, uh, one, if I could just add one point to what uh, the sheriff said is that I think this time also creates, creates a, a unique opportunity for us to rethink and streamline the current triage system. We know it today as 911 and we know that it works uh, in most cases. It might not work in some cases, but I think we have to seize that opportunity to rethink this algorithm that would instead um, uh, uh, connect those calls with the people uh, who are best able to, uh, to serve uh, individuals afflicted with mental health or substance use um, conditions uh, for appropriate service. So, so I think we have a system in place. I think we can only build up on it and, and we are our own limiting agent, agents. It is up to us to change it in a way that it actually continues um, improving value in the service to those who need it um, in those, for example, two categories of, uh, of, of illness. Well, uh, I was about to say one more question. I, Representative Christensen also wants to ask one, but then we, we uh, need to move on in order to be able to hear um, the other folks we've asked to come today. So uh, Representative Smith, Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, 
time is of the essence. If you receive a phone call uh, where someone is in need or there's a, there's a situation that you have to determine or your department has to determine whether you should make a phone call to a mental health service or not. And saying that time is of the essence, is this going to deter anything when you have to determine whether should I call uh, human services or should we pursue this or, or would you pursue it anyway? You know what I mean? I think you're there. Yes, I believe I do know what you mean. We're always going to err on the side of caution and be responding to these situations to make because people are calling for a reason. You know, they're Absolutely. not they're not usually calling just for no reason at all. So um, you know, we're definitely going to respond to make sure that everyone is safe and to make sure that we're not missing anything. Because again, we're not, you know, dispatchers, you know, 911 calls from Wilson, then it gets put to a you know a certain department, it'll get put through to the Orleans County Sheriff's Department, um, Newport Police Department. So things can get missed, um, you know, and communication can get skewed. So if there's any question whatsoever, we're going to respond and make sure that that person is not in need of anything, immediate Good. medical attention or anything of that nature. So. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Representative Christensen. Yes. I just had this question about, um, you know, we think 911, we've heard from several people, you know, so people don't call 911. Again, it's a great idea, but it's my understanding that the designated agencies already have a crisis line and not enough people use it. They use 911 instead. Wouldn't that, I mean, it sounds like a great idea, but everybody is trained to use 911, you know, during an emergency whether it's a physical health emergency or um, a law enforcement, I just don't understand. It's not an easy, easy fix to try to rethink everybody's psyche on how, who to call. That's, it's, I guess my question, if anybody has an answer to that, I'd love to hear it. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I have a uh, answer you might be looking for, but I think my answer to it would be to say that a part of the rethinking is uh, also re re rethinking how we use the resources that we currently have in place and what emphasis do we place on education, on promotion. Uh, I think we do have resources. Some of them might be underutilized or might not be uh, perhaps um, uh, leveraged in the best possible way. So the rethinking in my judgment, uh, at least in my mind, really speaks to uh, the breadth of what we need to evaluate as currently existing in, uh, as our resources at our disposal and how and if we need to change some of those, some of those approaches. Uh, certainly rerouting the calls, maybe making them more uh, uh, available to people by having people being aware of them is one of those, uh, those approaches. But, um, but I think uh, op the opportunity is there and we just have to seize it. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you both again, but in particular, <laughs> Sheriff Harlow for, um, for uh, turning around your time so quickly. Um, I, I'm going to ask, um, I'm just going to keep in line of the, the agenda, the way it's uh, listed out. So um, Dr. Reynolds, and just for the committee's background, um, uh, I've been uh, participating in the in the uh, legislative uh, social equity caucus. Um, Dr. Reynolds is a participant in that, and so I was the one who uh, reached out and asked her uh, if she would uh, share her thoughts from her perspective um, on the proposal and on the issue that we're uh, discussing. So, uh, Dr. Reynolds, if you could introduce yourself and um, uh, share your thoughts, and we would appreciate that. Need to unmute. You're muted. I, I thought I got off. Oh, now I'm on. Now you can't see me. It's funny how those little. There we go. Uh, now we can off. hear you and see you. Perfect. <laughs> this has been very interesting this morning. I've been here since the beginning. I'd like to be here until I have a client. My background really in in crisis work 
took place in Boston, Massachusetts, where I developed a program of multilingual, multiracial, and multi-ethnic team of mental health, very talented people, on, and with a psychiatrist, um, to go into homes in the inner cities and do basically family preservation work. We got a very large grant that let us set the program up. And by the time we were fully established and recognized as a resource for people, uh, like the Boston Juvenile Court, the Boston Juvenile Court approached us to give us a contract. Now we said, it must be that you cannot assign people to us. We will, you may refer people to get services from us, but we are going to be separate from you and DCF with DSS in Massachusetts because the police, the DCYF, the DSS people, uh, the courts, they are the enforcers. They are the wall. When we need them, we need them desperately. But it is so good to have a real dependent a uh, group of people willing to go in and take care of situations. Now, there were major mental illnesses in this group, although it was focused on family. And there were definitely a lot of dangerous situations. At one point, we as a team, when we meet, we said, what are we all just danger junkies? But we, we were having so much success, we just kept wanting to go on. So I, I have submitted a testimony and I have a long resume behind me and I'm not going into every detail of it. And I wanna respect your time limits because I can see that they're, that they're close. So I was impressed with Commissioner Sherling's report and now this morning from the Northeast Kingdom, what we heard, and it is good that at least some people were embedded in some forces and that it worked out. However, however, my thesis is that mental illness is a healthcare issue, not a police issue. And that somehow or other, the mental health system itself in Vermont needs an enormous infusion of not only funding resources, but high level mental health resources. And um, so I've made up a little thing. I do wanna read it because some of this is important details. It answers some of the questions even asked this morning. So why do we need to, why do we need to provide a crisis mental health emergency service? with mental health teams not connected to police departments. First of all, we are looking forward to a greater number of black, indigenous and people of color moving to homes in Vermont. Most of the horrendous murders of black and brown people by police in our country did not involve any mental health issues. However, many of uh, black and brown people in Vermont have a right to be fearful that these events could happen here. An attractive black man told me recently that the scariest place for him in white Vermont was in his car. And he's a very middle-class, well-educated man. And he's, he really is frightened by that prospect and is very, very careful in 25 mile an hour zones. And we all have read about the two prominent women of color who have been openly harassed and actually forced to move from their homes as a result of racist behavior. Number two, Vermont is not providing adequate services for the mental health needs of our citizens. By not providing sufficient funding for primary behavioral services, home-based care, experienced trauma therapists, and more easily access psychiatric care right over to warehousing our sick people in hospital emergency department corridors. And I've seen that. We are failing Vermonters. I understand why Commissioner Sherling perhaps had no other recourse than that of embedding 
mental health personnel in the state's police departments. Oh, my heart goes out to those mental health people. That is a very hard job out there alone. And I'm talking about teams of people who know what they're doing. And some case managers aren't sufficiently trained in diagnostic work. Number three, more robust emergency mental health services must be separated from identification with the police. Data reveals that in a crisis, in a crisis, Americans with mental illnesses make up nearly 25% of persons killed by police officers. And in addition, according to an article in the Washington Post, 115 police officers have also been killed since 1970s by persons with mental illnesses. But by and large, people with severe, even severe mental illnesses are not dangerous. And I have to underscore that many times, even when they're acting crazy, they are not dangerous, uh, physically violent, if they don't have a record of that before that. So what can we do about these systemic mental health delivery deficits while well, being mindful of equity and inclusion issues? One, other states have designed far more robust, robust mental health systems such as home services regularly provided. So the mental health to severe mental illness uh, we identify, uh, I mean, trained not case managers. So that when a provider, mental health provider shows up in their area, they're already, you know, whatever, wherever they are, they're already known to the people um, that might have such a situation that the families have to call for help. And they do. And Marie, it's absolutely right. 911, if something bad happened to me, I'd go to 911. Uh, I have gone to 911. And so, and they triaged it to an EMT, an emergency medical um, team. Okay, so uh, another example of. In, uh, of a way to do this is to include triaging 911 calls, just discussed, to refer them to emergency mental health services. One such clinic in Eugene, Oregon received, this is critically important, received 24,000 calls last year, of which only 1% required police backup as part of their response. We are not you're not being fair to our police to, to have this in their job description. Number two, our designated agencies with greatly increased budgets and a more decentralized, flexible approach could fill, possibly could fill this role. They need to be providing home-based services for a myriad of problems from family therapy and social service. So they need to know about social services as well as psychological services. They need to understand the environment they're in. Elder care, most certainly persons with severe mental illnesses. And this is so true. So often we need to be taking care of the distressed families who are trying to house our mental health um, uh, people, people with mental health problems. Um, skilled teams of mental health provider teams, yes, um, trained in robust strategies of emergency care with excellent backup support must be created um, like the EMTs. And I, I went into that, but I won't go into it further. So three, we need to- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. We were, uh, okay. I thought, I thought you were finished. I'm, I apologize. Number three, we need to reinvent the very concept of police. We need to listen to the contradicting meanings people hold for the term and deconstruct their functions. I recommend we form a diverse citizens-led task force, task force to examine the job activities currently falling to our police. They do not belong in schools and unless there's physical dangers, they do not belong in healthcare. There are other ways to approach suspected, suspected mental crisis situations. And I think I've outlined about that much. 
separate, you get it. I'm in favor of separating the functions. Uh, but I, I reiterate that the state is gravely lagging in providing adequate mental health at all levels of care from, uh, from taking care of people in their milieu. I love the idea of a peer support group we could be training. And it's very much the function that we might learn from AA or um, in it, like what happens in Vermont after Irene or now, because, um, because the communities came together and it's been a, an amazing thing. We could do very much more with that. Okay, and now this is my last point. <laughs> of course, we will need protection teams. Of course we will. This is the central job of the police. People do get out of control and with our open gun laws, People carrying assault weapons around are very much potentially dangerous or very scary for other people, especially people with mental illnesses. So police as protection teams could be respected and acknowledged as guardians of the peace, diverse in makeup and training, working in collaboration with citizen review panels. And I, I'm really surprised at the lack of conversations about citizen review panels and police in Vermont. I have to say, I'm a Vermonter. My father grew up as, on a farm in Castleton, Vermont. And even if I was born in New York, which was an accident, I consider myself a Vermonter, always owned a home in Vermont. And um, even if I spent 28 years in Boston, getting very good training at places like the Boston City Hospital and their emergency room, um, I am a Vermonter and I came back here 20 years ago and I'm never leaving again. Anyway, my conclusion is that this com combination of police as protectors and guardians with emergency mental health service teams, well-trained mental health providers who are persons with empathy, knowledgeable about community resources, above all experience and diagnosis and adequately trained in diverse issues of our citizens would be a great help. So yes, job descriptions of Friday's police need changing. They will not serve in schools and they will not be the first called an emergency mental crisis. Yes, their budgets will be reduced to contribute to the mental health care services so cr critically needed uh, of, on all levels in the state. I know we can do better. We can examine, examine models of emergency services in other states. And above all, we must commit to funding mental health far better, far, far better than we do at present in Vermont. That's it. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. I appreciate that. We are running quite a bit behind. Um, if there's a burning question that someone has uh, specifically um, for Dr. Reynolds, I don't want to cut it off, but uh, um, otherwise we will move forward. All right, thank you again. Thank you very much. And thank uh, you. Uh, uh, and next up we have uh, AJ Rubin, who's with um, Disability Rights Vermont. Um, welcome and please uh, introduce yourself and, and uh, share your uh, response to the proposal. Hello, can, um, can you hear me? Yes, um, I'm AJ Rubin from Disability Rights Vermont. We are your mental health ombudsman as well as the designated federal protection advocacy agency in Vermont. I have submitted written comments. Um, I hope you were all you all got a chance to read those. Um, of importance um, is our report that we issued in March of this year called "Wrongly Confined." Uh, I, I urge everyone to read it, um, and specifically in this conversation, it highlights Dr. Uh, Reynolds' comments. Um, and also um, World of White's comments that there, there's just a dearth of, uh, of adequate capacity in the state uh, and it, it causes crisis and it really should be what's addressed. Um, the quick points, and I'll get off the, the, off the uh, witness seat, are, um, our suggestion is that uh, it would be appropriate to move the funding out of the Department of Public Safety and put it in the Department of Mental Health. Uh, and it would be appropriate to consider requiring the Department of Mental Health to contract with um, uh, psychiatric survivors, peer, uh, trained peers, um, uh, when creating responses to um, 
calls for um, 911 calls. Um, we believe that that would, that would move us towards uh, a better, more equitable and a safer system. And it, we would just emphasize that having um, trained, educated peers be involved in the planning and training and importantly, the policy development will help alleviate the harm that this proposal could cause by basically in, um, using coercive state forces like crisis workers who can EE you, emergency evaluate you, and police who can arrest you and shoot you. Um, it, would, it would alleviate those concerns. Um, I think you heard from Bor Yang yesterday from the Human Rights Commission. Um, uh, she may have talked with you about the fact that through their work, they've identified that sometimes police social workers, much like prison social workers, wind up uh, because they're isolated from their own peer group being uh, co-opted and somehow not used as effectively as possible. Um, that's, that's happened in a couple of states, a couple of cities we've been looking at. So I'll, I will um, refer you back to my written comments and, and um, uh, applaud you all for taking the time to consider this very important uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there, are there any uh, follow-up questions for um, AJ Rubin? Appreciate the comments. We do have the written comments. I hope people, if they haven't yet, will get a chance to read them. Um, and uh, thank you for your brevity because we're getting closer to be being uh, back on time. I, and I apologize, I see a hand up from a witness and, and we can't follow that process, but if you'd like to send us some thoughts or notes in writing as follow-up, uh, we would welcome that, um, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Malika Puffer. If you could join us and uh, uh, intro introduce yourself and your uh, your role, and uh, uh, share your thoughts on the proposal, um, alternatives, and so forth. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Representative Donahue, and thank you all for having me. I really appreciate so much the um, invitation to the Adult State Standing Committee. Um, that doesn't happen. Uh, often enough and would love to see that happen in the future as well. So big gratitude for that. Um, I'm could you maybe, uh, I think that's a good point that we haven't often, yeah. could you briefly explain what that committee is? Yeah, um, so uh, we are a uh, legislatively mandated committee um, that advises the uh, Department of Mental Health and the Commissioner of Mental Health um, on a number of issues that affect the system of care. Um, we are essentially the voice of the community directly to the department, um, although hopefully not to the exclusion of other ways of gathering input. But um, yeah, that's our role and we, we really much appreciate the invitation. Does that address that enough? Yes, Anne? thank you. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I'm here today with multiple hats on. Um, uh, first and foremost, I'm a psychiatric survivor. I've experienced almost every level of care in the uh, public mental health system in Vermont, both as a uh, child and as an adult, um, including being shipped out of state um, as a teenager because the resources didn't exist in my own community or in the state, um, and also including having interactions with law enforcement that were initiated by uh, mental health providers where there was no, um, no threat and, and no law breaking. Um, so those are experiences I will be uh, recovering from for a long time, if not forever, and uh, inform the work that I do as an advocate. Um, I've advocated for people in the community, in the emergency departments, in the hospital, um, in residential programs, and in interactions with law enforcement. Um, and um, I also manage peer support services at HCRS. I've um, been doing that for seven years. So I've experienced recruiting, training, supervising peer support advocates, and also designing um, peer support programs, both within the public mental health system and outside. And also I'm a leader at HCRS um, beyond that role. And um, so of course, HCRS has a police social worker program that I have interacted with and also supported people who have interacted with. Um, so I think I'm coming at this with quite a bit of context. Um, and I really, um, you know, so much uh, respect and appreciate the individuals that I work with who are in police social worker roles. I think they're excellent people and excellent um, professionals, um, but I don't support this proposal. Um, 
uh, but I love the, the intention behind it, which I believe is to reduce the incidence of harm caused by law enforcement when people are in emotional distress. I think this is a place where people understand, we have a cultural understanding that um, police can be dangerous and um, don't always result in people's needs getting met. And I think um, we're not yet at a place where people understand the ways in which the mental health system very much parallels law enforcement system. And so that's what, one of the things that I'd like to address. And I'd like to spend time talking about solutions because I think there are real solutions. Um, but I think uh, essentially there's an assumption that while well, we recognize police, uh, when they show up, there's some risk there. Um, there's not an understanding of, of the risk that mental health providers propose. There's an assumption that they don't um, uh, lead to incarceration, that they don't um, result in bodily harm, that they don't uh, shorten people's lifespans, um, and et cetera. So uh, I think of police as sort of like the arm or the extension of the institution or incarceration in jail or prison. They both bring people into that institution and they sort of extend the, the power of that institution into the community. And mental health providers, especially the crisis branch of the mental health system, which police social workers are part of, functions very similarly as an arm of the institution of the psychiatric facility, which is another form of incarceration. There's no meaningful difference between psychiatric incarceration and incarceration in a jail or prison, except for the way that we sort of think about it and talk about it. Um, so, so the mental health system and, and the crisis particularly is sort of the arm of that institution, both to bring people in and to sort of enforce the power of it outside of its walls. Um, and uh, that is the, is the psychiatric institutions um, are pose a danger to people, both because they separate us from our communities and because we are, when we interact with the mental health system, we're entering a system where people die on average 25 years earlier than everyone else. And also psychiatric institutions, when, when you're discharged, you're 20 times or more, more likely to die by suicide. So I think when we're talking about police versus crisis response, we're not talking about a potentially dangerous response versus a risk neutral response. We're also talking about a response that carries risk, very significant risk. If I were ever in a situation myself where I desperately needed help again, um, I would not feel comfortable calling the police. I would not feel comfortable calling the police if they had a police social worker on staff. I wouldn't feel comfortable calling a police social worker directly. I wouldn't feel comfortable calling a crisis team if I even knew how to reach them um, or if they were even available. Um, I, I, so this is, this is why essentially I think this proposal falls short because we need another option. And I'm, that's what I wanna talk about. But even if people did universally feel, you know, I'd much rather talk to a social worker who has the power of forced drugging, forced um, incarceration um, than a police officer. I don't think, I still think this proposal falls short in that area because as we've heard before, Police social workers um, or embedded clinicians are generally not showing up to calls instead of police. At best, when they're showing up to calls with police, the police are still taking the response that they're gonna take. Um, so we're not really talking about doing anything significantly different. If anything, this proposal might increase collaboration, but, but I still have very significant doubts there because that's a lot to put on one individual to bridge a huge, potentially huge gap. We have other ways of trying to address that. Um, and, I, and I would hope personally that we, we could trust um, sheriffs like uh, Jennifer Harlow, who seems competent to identify where are the people who need follow-up after frequent police interactions and make that referral. I don't, I don't understand um, why that can't happen through the regular ways that organizations collaborate. So solutions and alternatives. Um, others have talked about the issue with 911 and police response. We need to decouple uh, calling 911 with police response. 
so that people can call 911. They can get police response. That's not going away right now. They can also call 911 and get uh, mental health crisis response. But also because for me and many people like me, neither of those are safe alternatives. And they're, when someone feels threatened, which both of those systems can be extremely threatening, that's when they're more likely to be dangerous or violent. So we need a third option. When you call 911, you can get police, you can get crisis, or you can get peer support. As many people have talked about the importance, the important role of peer support. And by peer support, I should be clear about what, what I mean because many people use that language to talk about different things. Um, I'm talking about people who can speak from their own lived experience and not have in their tool belt things that will be a threat to people. Uh, forced drugging, forced hospitalization, and that kind of thing. Those options are still going to be there, but to have someone who can show up and just actually provide the connection and support people are looking for. Um, and, and then also along with that, we need a place for people to go other than the, um, the ER when they're in crisis. I heard Jennifer Harlow say, say that um, one of the roles that police can do is go there, show up, and then if they need to talk to another human being, if they need to talk to someone, we can bring them to the hospital. What if people could just talk to a person without going to the hospital or interacting with police first? So we need drop-in spaces instead of the ER and we need peer respites instead of the hospital as additional options. I'm about to wrap up. Um, I think an initial step, as I realize this is a big long-term vision, um, is creating a pilot program or expanding upon the peer support programs that already exist and which are non-carceral, meaning that they're not an arm of one of those forms of incarceration that I talked about. And um, I'll stop there and see if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? A lot that you've put out there, so it may take some people thinking. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, and I don't have a hand to raise otherwise, apologies. Um, so it, would you, you are currently, managing or running a peer support program at HCRS is that that am I correct did yeah. I understand that correctly is is there do you experience an inherent conflict between working within an agency a designated agency to do peer support uh, and your concerns about the role of mental health workers generally or can can peer supports be integrated in the way that it appears that you're describing uh, and to have, have, have the ability to operate uh, again in the level that you would like to see? That's a really astute question. Um, and um, I think the answer is sometimes maybe. Um, <laughs> I think that it's, it's uncommon that a, a designated agency is willing to provide peer support, the level of autonomy um, and risk tolerance, frankly, in terms of uh, liability, although I think the perception of that is very much overblown. Um, I think it is possible, um, but there needs to be some clarity about what that looks like and, and a direction and oversight from people um, like us. And do you feel like you have that autonomy? Um, yes, I think the-, the... And Without saying, without knowing that we can't go in depth here, but I, I would be interested in hearing more at some point in time to hear what the positives or the conflicts might be? Yeah, I think we are very close. I think we're, there's just a little bit of barrier in the way for us, but I think we are closer to that than any other um, sort of embedded peer support team that I'm aware of. So in some ways you're somewhat functioning as a pilot project. Yes, except we really have very limited capacity. We are four people in an agency of 600 right. employees. And so we don't have the capacity to respond in a active mobile crisis response that I think would show what we what we need to show. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Christensen. Yes, we heard from the Howard Center the other day that there is a peer group, peer support group within the designated agencies, but it's controversial within the peer groups. Did you, I know you've been talking about some of the controversy, but can you just in a nutshell say what that controversy is that makes it clear or is it different depending on the different peer groups and the different DAs? 
I, yeah, I can't speak for Howard Center. I'm not so intimately aware of the, the challenges there, but I think generally what the controversy is about peer support within a DA is that if the agency is putting an expectation on peer workers that will, if someone says they might be thinking about dying, you need to involve crisis. Well, then that's not really a different kind of support because that threat is still ever present in the conversation, um, if, that, if that makes sense. A little bit. So I think, so if, if peer support was existing outside of the system altogether, and I'm responding to you and you're having a really hard time, maybe you're thinking about dying or you, you're having some beliefs that, that might potentially pose some risk, you and I can decide together as individual people, do we need to bring in police? Do we need to go to the hospital? Do we need to talk to a clinician? We can decide that as, as people together rather than the agency imposing on me as the employee, here's your prescription of how you're going to respond if X, Y, Z is said or done. Um, so it's not that we never use emergency response, but that there isn't a, uh, a sort of a formulaic or um, a prescribed uh, situation in which we bring those folks in. That's, that's where there's sort of a rub. I don't know if that's the controversy at Howard Center at all. That's, I think, in terms of the, the situations that I'm talking about where I think there's potential challenge in doing this kind of work within a DA system because they're not likely to tolerate that degree of mutual case-by-case um, -case individual decision-making that I think is really necessary to create safety. Do you not think that there should be a triage system, especially if it it's escalating? I mean, you have social workers that have training, certain training. You have police who have certain training, for better or worse, we're at this point. But um, do you not believe a triage system is important? I don't think there is a reliable triage system that exists. Um, I think that's the problem. There's, there's this cultural idea that mental health professionals are able to accurately and reliably predict risk or dangerousness, and that's just not true, which I know by both anecdotal experience and by research uh, that exists out there. Um, and so let me give you an example. I've been in the emergency department supporting someone who had, uh, it doesn't matter why they were there. There was a concern that they might die by suicide. And the person was saying, no, I'm not going to, I'm gonna use these supports. And the crisis person, the QMHP said, well, I'm really not sure what you're going to do. Maybe you'll be okay, maybe you won't. But in order to play it, I, I wanna be on the safe side. And so I'm gonna submit an application for involuntary treatment. The, the default of the system is to CYA, take care of, you know, attend to liability as part of risk, um, which might not actually make the most sense for what is best for that individual's well-being. So, Absolutely. If triage means we're going to really think about what is the risk factors here and what are the resources and what is best for this person, 100%. Um, but if triage means if you hit check these boxes, then we're going to do our, our coercive carceral response, then I think that's a problem. And at least in peer support, that's a problem. So one last just follow up. So it's more of the culture of the system that you feel needs to be changed, not so much a yeah, it, system, but but the the whole all along the line, the police, the social workers, the the DA, the the peer support groups, all need to be on the same page. I think that yes, and I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, there's so many reasons why things are the way that they are. And so what I'm proposing is that we add another layer of options for people um, so that people still have those options, but they also have the options of uh, peer support and, and um, sort of support that's not connected to jail, prison, or psychiatric facility. Although those are still gonna be there for people if, that what is, if that's what's needed. Okay, thank you. Very much. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time and testimony, Maleka. And, and uh, we're gonna uh, move to our final um, witness for the morning, um, Rob Appel.
And uh, I think uh, he would do best to give a brief um, summary of his background and how that relates to the specific um, issue before us and any thoughts he can share on that. Great, thank you, Ann. Uh, good morning. I guess it's now afternoon to all who are on this um, call, Zoom. Um, my name is Robert Appel. I know many of you, some of you I don't. I was an active participant in 20 years of policy making in uh, the legislature, spent many hours in front of uh, Chairman Lippert's committee and judiciary and uh, with Representative Donahue and Health and Welfare and others. So um, I, my background is a little unusual. I, uh, I read law. I was hired as an investigator in the Civil Rights Unit of the Attorney General's Office in 1980. I worked for the state for 33 years in a variety of positions. Most notably, I was Defender General, head of the public defender system through the 90s. And then I was executive director of the Human Rights Commission from 01 to 2012 when I retired from the state. I'm not retired totally. I am now a, a, a solo uh, private practitioner in Burlington area. The bulk of my work is uh, dealing with people with psychiatric or other disabilities in the employment setting, in the criminal justice system. Um, so I have a lot of experience in the areas that you're, 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 you're dealing with. I've had the opportunity to represent several victims of police violence um, who, uh, McAdam Mason, who was tased to death in Thetford in 2012 um, by uh, an overzealous state police officer, in my view. Um, and then I, I represented a, a man in the middle of a mental health crisis in Winooski who was shot by a Winooski officer who survived. I worked on other police shootings, uh, one in Faiston where an officer rolled in and let go of nine rounds um, for a person who was in a mental health crisis and, and drunk. Uh, he hit him in the leg, fortunately he survived and then he suicided. Um, so I do have considerable experience in, in the area particularly from the uh, quote victim's perspective, the recipient of police violence. I also work a lot with police officers. Um, my background in criminal justice leads me to understand police culture, which is a separate distinct culture, unfortunately. There are many fine officers. Uh, and then there are those who are probably um, should be finding something else to do with their lives. And the challenge, as many of you know, is trying to separate the wheat from the chaff, as we're seeing in Burlington at the present time. So, um, and I'm late to your meeting, although I was glad to hear the testimony of, of, of Dr. Reynolds and Ms. Puffer. Um, it really set the tone for what I wish to share with you. Um, and I did in preparation for our testimony, I, I, I was speaking with judiciary about use of force by officers, uh, S-119. So there's a lot of overlap between what you're working on and what they're working on, which is common in, in, in your body. And I commend both committees for taking up this very important work so late in the in this session. Um, it's ongoing work. My guess is uh, once you respond to this proposal, there will be more it's constantly evolving field um, and we learn more and hopefully we do better. So I, I, I did review, review uh, Commissioner Sherling's proposal with no disrespect to Michael, I've worked with over the years as during his term as chief in Burlington and other contexts. It's pretty standard in my view that we're, we're back to this bureaucratic um, silo mentality as to who does what and who gets the money. Um, this has been a longstanding battle within um, the executive branch for as long as I can remember. And I, I see many um, problems in locating mental health crisis response capacity with police. And let me talk a little bit about um, why 
and I'll cycle back to dispatch and triage, which I think is a critical issue that we have undervalued for forever. Um, so the, the circumstances that I've talked about where I've represented people who have been shot or killed in the middle of a mental health crisis, uh, goes like this. And, and, and in preparation for my testimony today, I reread the, the excellent report uh, of the Vermont Mental Health Crisis Response Commission. And I, if you've not reviewed it in the context of this discussion, I, I really recommend you do so. It's an excellent report. And what was most striking to me in reviewing it was the transcript of the initial response by the Burlington Police Department to uh, a 911 call regarding Ralph Grennan, uh, who was a 76 year old man in the midst of a mental health crisis, who was um, killed in his apartment. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the facts, I'm not going to go into them, but in my view, this was a picture perfect disaster and 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 unfortunately very typical that when um police respond to a person in mental health health crisis they tend to do what police do and their training and their orientation uh is to uh control and clear that's that's what we train police officers to do and 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 i know there's been discussion and it's Hopefully it will continue about the role of police officers as either warriors or peacekeepers. I'm in the latter camp that, and, and many cops do this very well. And unfortunately some get stuck in the warrior mentality. So that, that's a broader discussion, but I think it's important to keep that in mind when you're assessing um, this proposal before you. So Put yourself in the position, I really appreciated uh, Ms. Puffer's testimony of, of being a person in the midst of a crisis. And in response, somebody calls 911. You didn't ask them to call 911. Um, and the response is somebody in warrior garb shows up with a siren and light, uh, gets out of the cruiser, may have a hand on a weapon, be it uh, service weapon or taser uh, with a tool belt with all sorts of devices to exert control, which again is the police orientation, uh, body armor, and a uniform. And if someone is in a crisis mode, is that presence going to escalate or de-escalate the person in crisis? I think you all know the answer. It's a rhetorical question. The notion of crisis intervention teams is not a new one. I'm sure you're aware of that. It's been around for a while. Um, however, if, 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 if that capacity is within the police, then you're, you're allowing the police to control that capacity. And not police orientation, as I said earlier, is control and clear. Um, there has been emphasis in late of late and slowing down as a ADA, uh, Americans with Disability Act, uh, uh, modification of practice to allow police to better assess, uh, better evaluate, and give the person in crisis some time to adjust to the presence of a uniform. But again, that, that, that's an emerging concept. It's far from uniform. As you probably know, we have something like 75 different police agencies in the state with varying policies and practices and accountability and philosophy. So, um, but I think the uniform response to a uniform is escalation. I've never seen a client calm down in the presence of that show of force. I think there's much to commend the use of peer um, professionals who were trained and well compensated for the risk taken in that work, who, who should be our frontline response to people in crisis and not controlled by police. That they, people who have had the lived experience of being in, in, the, in that crisis mode, I think are, and come in civilian clothes and perhaps at, it would be best if there was a prior relationship, if you can find someone who has some knowledge of the person in crisis and, and a relationship and can communicate with that person 
in an effort to de-escalate rather than ratchet up the stress because with stress on both sides, um, it builds conflict to the point where you're gonna have tragic outcomes. Um, and cops get escalated as well. I mean, I used the term agitating and provoking in my earlier testimony, which is a term well known to correctional officers who claim inmates do it, but at the same time officers do it. So it just sort of ratchets up, which is what I saw in the Greenwich situation. Um, officers get frustrated. This is not primarily what they were hired and trained to do. So again, I commend the use of, of, of peer professionals who are compensated based on their skill set and their abilities to de-escalate as opposed to their credentials. It's easy for me to speak as an uncredentialed lawyer. I mean, there's many ways to gain skills and capacities and, and competencies. So I, I think that's a way better model. And now backing back to, um, well, let me say one more thing. So, so once the officer controls, contains, and clears, often that results in the application of some form of restraint on the person and transport to another location, which is more trauma. Uh, and I understand an officer's need to cuff a person in the back of a cruiser. Bad things happen when you let somebody rattle around in there, Freddie Gray in Baltimore, or the threat to the officer, or the threat to the, the, the integrity of the cruiser. To me, it's just a very wrong-headed approach to what cries out for de-escalation. So cycling back to the criticality dispatch, in my view, and many of you will remember five, eight years ago, public safety decided, and it was budget budgetarily driven, compressing four public safety dispatch units into two. Uh, those folks do an amazing job. They're underpaid, they're overworked and undertrained. Um, I think it was Dr. Reynolds who talked about 911 being the common response and it is. We're all trained in, in time of crisis to dial 911. Well, 911 could do a better if we had more skilled, more supported, um, more, more evaluative people answering that phone and answering relevant questions, we could avoid some of the tragic outcomes that, that we've seen. Um, and the response could be to the alternatives that both Dr. Reynolds and, and Ms. Puffer spoke to in terms of people with lived experiences responding. I'm not disregarding the role of law enforcement in, in that response, but I think they need to be staged in the background, not the foreground. Yes, some people, you know, there's this perception that different and da is dangerous. People with mental health, with, with mental health issues are by nature more dangerous than that. It has definitely shown that that's not true, but the perception exists. So, um, there are occasions where force will be necessary to control and, and prevent harm to others. Um, I was frankly happily surprised in S-119 to show that uh, your body hopefully will, show, will, will, will enact a law that says you can't kill somebody to keep somebody from killing themselves. To me, that's just, which is, happens over and over again. Um, some people who are determined to suicide will suicide, unfortunately. Um, but killing them to avoid it makes no sense to me. I'm not a proponent of the death penalty. Killing people to prevent, to punish murder doesn't make sense to me either. But um, I, I think that sort of gives you an overview of my sense of, of the issues and the need to keep funding stream separate, control separate, the imprimatur of, and I think uh, Malika spoke to this of, and I think Dr. Maynard did as well, of having mental health workers as adjunct to law enforcement taints in the initial response. It just does. Um, I've thrown a lot out there. Uh, I know your time is short, so I'll be quiet and see if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much, Rob. Are there any um, specific questions um, for uh, Rob Appel? Because uh, otherwise, we have a little bit of time just to 
uh, share some reactions, but if there's something specific for Rob, um, anybody has a question, let's uh, deal with that first. All right, thank you very much. I think everybody uh, this morning has given us a lot to think about. And we do only have about 10 minutes left, but um, in the interest of starting to think about uh, how we put a recommendation or proposal together, um, and, and we'll need to end up putting that in the, in the format ultimately of a, of a potentially like a bu budget um, language that would replace the placeholder language that we put in. Um, but it would be great if people could just, a um, little bit of brainstorming, just some of your reactions or thoughts um, that you have at this point in terms of the, uh, the type of reaction we should have as a committee. Uh, Representative Smith. I have a question for anyone on the committee. Uh, I listened to the testimony today and Ms. Puffer mentioned a third party entering in on this. Now, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ann, I mean, you, you follow this probably more clearly than I can, but uh, if you've got a sheriff's department involved and you've got a mental health service involved and you've got a third party uh, friend or whoever involved. You got three people trying to decide who should do something while this poor person is sitting out there, maybe wanting to off himself or herself. And three people are gonna talk about it. I think it's gonna impede a potential disaster. And what would you, what would you think of that? I, I think that really goes to some of the different pieces of testimony that we received about um, the critical um, triage kind of component. Um, where is that call coming in and where is the skill level um, when that call comes in of identifying up front who should respond first? Um, you don't want all, you don't want three different, I agree, you don't want three different people. That's my sense. You don't want three different people trying to sort out, is it I you, is it you, is it you? Uh, or let's all go and sort out when we get there who who's best to respond first. Um, I think I think your point's well taken. I think that's part of the sorting out. I I found um, uh, Tomas Jankowski's uh, testimony personally really compelling in terms of um, we need to look at at how we reframe how we respond and that and I think that's part of it. Thank you. Other thoughts, uh, Representative Durfee. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, it just occurs to me that we've heard a lot of testimony about the triage system, about the you know, what happens when you place that phone call. And it seems like there's some potential there to move the needle a little bit. We haven't had any, and we're not gonna have time to have any, I suspect, testimony from, direct testimony about that from people who were working there or from public safety. Uh, it's intriguing to me. It's something that I think we'll wanna, that the next, uh, during the next biennium, the next healthcare committee might wanna think about a little bit. Uh, Representative Reed. Yes, I, I agree that the triage question is interesting and it seems like you're shifting a, a, a big piece of responsibility onto that person taking that call if you're if you're trying to have them be the air traffic controller of the best place for a, a potential response. I, I do like the idea of a, a, a kind of third alternative of, of somebody that I think especially that point about um, somebody that doesn't have the power to confine me either in jail or in a you know involuntary uh, hospitalization uh, I, I don't know if the the person having the crisis would necessarily understand that at the moment but um, it, it is uh, I think an important piece of, of making this work I, I guess what I came away with from the couple of days of testimony is that it seems like most of the people that are closest to the situation from the mental health perspective don't think this is a good idea. Uh, 
And I, I think there are some benefits and obviously that there are some models that have worked, uh, but it, it does seem like uh, the models that have worked, a lot of it comes down to the individuals involved being the, having the right mindset to, uh, to either on the, on the law enforcement side or the mental health side to, to make this work and not to uh, turn it into uh, uh, you know, the, the warrior side of things. So um, just my, my perspective so far. Thank you, uh, Representative Gina. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciated hearing all the different testimony today. Um, it was very detailed and I feel like it was needed. And there, there's there been some people who said they, that they never heard the argument against having embedded social workers. And I think today we and yesterday, we got some pretty detailed um, perspectives of people who've been directly impacted by, by the, um, the harm of the mental health system and the police. And so I wanna thank everyone for publicly speaking out and, get, and getting your perspectives on the record. And um, the, I mean, I'm leaving, leaving this discussion sort of thinking more about like, how do we move in the direction of some kind of changing what 911 does? Um, and the idea that like, you know, when a call comes into 911, them taking a few seconds to send it to the right next step. And if that step is the police, then police can be dispatched. But it sounds like there are other possible streams like peer support, crisis, um, there's things that maybe weren't specifically mentioned that come to mind, like maybe someone who can work with people who are houseless, maybe um, domestic violence advocates. Um, but what's coming out of this is that what I'm, what's standing out to me is that the solution isn't just going to be to send social workers with police, that it's going to be a more um, specific response to the call in the end. And I'm not sure how... Um, and I also just want to also emphasize the importance of peer services, that that, that that really stands out to me. And that's a part of the mental health system I think we need to drastically enhance. And I say that as a, as a mental health clinician, that I feel like that's the part where we need to like invest the most honestly, um, is in the peer support and in a wide range of peer support. But that being said, we're here because we're about to vote on a budget. And I'm, st I'm, I'm struggling at this point with making sense of how all of this fits into the current budget. Because what I'm hearing, and, and maybe other committee members or witnesses could, could help me with this, what I'm hearing is that um, what we need is not actually what we're doing. So I'm curious, like I've been trying to look through the budget while listening to people, it's 201 pages. Ann Donahue, you're like the expert of the budget. So maybe you could tell us what pages to look at, but I'm trying to find the language that we're actually hearing testimony on to see how deficient it actually is, to be honest, um, you know, and and how how and what it's actually doing versus not doing based on the need we've heard. So uh, I think that's a helpful thing to as as we get a few final comments and wrap up this morning for where people should look back to and and maybe um, send email comments or whatever to to Bill and Lori and I. Um, there was not language in the administration's budget. There was the funding from within the DPS budget for seven embedded workers. And there wasn't budget language, but there was the written proposal from DPS explaining what their intent was. So that's the written piece that we have on that end. Um, the placeholder language that uh, we shared, when was it? <laughs> middle of last week, when, whenever, because the budget had to move, we put in placeholder language that basically simply said, this money should be invested in this need. Uh, we're saying it should be in the Department of Mental Health. And then from there, uh, the response proposal with the involvement of, uh, you know, mental health peers, psych survivors um, should, should be crafted based on that. So that's where it stands now. That's the language that's in the budget as a placeholder. And what we would be doing is, uh, is potentially recommending um, something other than that language as what we think um, the House budget should include regarding that money that uh, actually comes from within the DPS budget, um, but that in the current budget before the House, um, tomorrow um, is with the placeholder language set to go into the, to be transferred into the Department of Mental Health budget. So that that's the status uh, 
right now. I appreciate so. it. And, and it, it sounds like what I heard is that we made a policy decision to acknowledge that the investment should be made in the Department of Mental Health instead of the Department of Public Safety. Is that correct? And that I, possibility I, about- I wouldn't say we made that policy decision because the decision was that our committee, the healthcare committee should weigh in that potentially that that was the direction it should it should be. Um, but that's why it's called, you know, placeholder language. So there wasn't really a full a policy decision. It was sort of a temporary holding pattern that that perhaps that was the the direction that we would want to be going. Um, if I may, yep. I might add that 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 lang that decision was made in some preliminary consultation with the Speaker of the House in terms of trying to create placeholder language that then would allow for the testimony that we're taking now that we've been taking and for the possibility or, the, or asking our committee to take the lead on making a more a fuller recommendation uh, that the House Appropriations Committee would use in their process with the budget uh, with the Senate proposal. I should mention as well, I'll just mention briefly that, uh, and we're gonna to need to stop here shortly, uh, that the Senate Health and Welfare Committee has scheduled some testimony, I believe today, maybe even. Uh, tomorrow, I, I think it's tomorrow. I mean, tomorrow, it's tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow with some of the same witnesses we've heard from, but in a much uh, more reduced, I think they're taking an hour of testimony. Um, and we, we have time scheduled tomorrow in our committee for committee discussion, not further testimony, to try to see if we can come to a proposal that our committee can support to, to enhance or replace the placeholder language that is currently in the budget that's going to the floor tomorrow and Friday. So I know we're out of, out of time, Bill, if we can squeeze yep. it in, I'd love to hear, you know, one, one sentence reactions from, uh, we've got, uh, or people who would like to share thoughts. So sure. uh, that would be, yeah, so Representative Cortez. Amazing testimony. Thank you, everyone. Um, I can wait until discussion tomorrow. The short response is no money to DPS if we're going to donate and donate. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> and in, in, uh, if we're going to appropriate money, it needs to go to mental health. Um, and clearly we need systemic change as a bigger project and we need uh, those directly impacted and involved in mental health leading that. Um, Representative Page. A nice idea, uh, a recommendation, but I don't think it's good. I can't hear you, Woody. I can't hear you. I think this was a nice idea that the governor's proposed budget but it doesn't really get to fixing the problem. Um, I would like to see the money go to the mental health uh, programs, but I'd like to see where those funds go. I, you know, we should be looking kind of outside of the box. We should be looking at, I think maybe it was Ms. Puffer or maybe uh, Mr. Appel said, we should be maybe re-engineering or restructuring our mental health and, and, and changing changing the way we do things here in Vermont with regards to our mental health. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And but I'm, I'm, against, I'm against this. Representative Rogers. I'm having internet issues, so I'm hoping I don't cut out. Um, I, I've, I think my sentiments are similar to Brian Sheena's in that um, I'm kind of, taking in a lot of really incredible testimony and trying to make sense of putting it into the budget. Can people still hear me? Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I think I just wanted to bookmark something that, that Wilda White said in the beginning. Um, I think just reflecting for myself that at least to some extent, this whole discussion has come up because of an increased national level of awareness of racism and particularly the intersection between racism and policing. And I realize the discussion is mu about much more than that, but I think it's fair to say that that probably is a part of why we're having the discussion now. And just recognizing and remembering that we know that racism and racial disparities 
are documented to exist in Vermont in our police system as they are in our mental health system. And so just wanting to make sure that we're, we're recognizing that the issue of what is policing and what is mental health is a very important issue and isn't in and of itself necessarily addressing what is the racism that people are experiencing in either or both systems. And so just to, to bookmark that and make sure that we're not losing sight of that piece as well. Thank you. And we'll close off with Anne-Marie. Yes, I'm, I'm for, uh, I agree with what everybody said, but I see putting this money into mental health rather than the police. But I think the concept of the embedded is good, but needs to change. But that's not it. It's like, I think we should put this into the mental health budget because, and earmark this for crisis workers who police can call. I know down here, we have such small, we have a two person department. They spent, I talked to the police chief, sometimes he spends half a week dealing with the same person who is in mental health crisis, who thinks the neighbors are gonna come and shoot them and stuff. And he can't leave her until a mental health worker gets there so he can turn it over. They don't wanna be there, the police, but sometimes there's not enough mental health workers to answer the call. So he has to wait until, so I think there is a need for this, you know, to work together, but I don't think we need to send the troops in and give the police the money to muster the troops to go in when there is a crisis. I think it should be mental health workers. That's it. Thank you, everyone. I'm gonna turn it back over to the chair to end the meeting. <laughs> uh, we're over time. Yeah, we are over time, but uh, thank you everyone. Thank you to our witnesses and, uh, and especially several of our witnesses who really did respond on virtually no notice, uh, just so committee members can appreciate, uh, particularly Jennifer Harlow, I believe, uh, really responded at the last minute. And I think it was a good request. Thank you, Woody, for making the suggestion. Um, I, I, I'll save my comments for tomorrow. Uh, uh, maybe I'll just say broadly that I think we have, we have to think in terms of what, of, of what we can do now, what we can set in motion and uh, what are some of our, and to acknowledge perhaps some of our already ongoing long-term commitments that this committee has made. And so that we, we can uh, underscore some of those because we, we the, the issues before us are bigger and broader, deeper and more uh, involved than uh, the single proposal that's in front of us, but it has prompted some really important testimony uh, on the part of our, all of our witnesses. So, I uh, look forward to us thinking together tomorrow and working toward a proposal that we can uh, move forward to our colleagues. Uh, I think it was appropriate that our committee has taken this on. Uh, so thank you all. We'll, uh, I think we're, uh, that's just as a reminder, uh, can someone help me? I think we're on the floor today at two for a, for, a, for a general caucus, a caucus of the whole at two and then on the floor at three. Uh, and then we're back here in committee tomorrow. 12 to two. 12 to two. Uh, and then, uh, so tomorrow, let's, let's be prompt at uh, 12 to two tomorrow. And uh, if you have thoughts, uh, copy the whole committee, but uh, yeah. copy, copy and Lori and I, but feel free to copy the whole committee. This is a committee discussion. So thank you all. Uh, see you on the screen at two o'clock, two o'clock. And thank you again, witnesses. Okay, I'll stop. Thank the you, Demis. You can you can stop the live stream. Yes. Thank you.